He had a normal psychological composition, no weird belief system. He's just a dude uh, that was going to work at a Navy base and you know, he had a freaking huge crap. At least the physical proof he provided, he drew what he saw, no sound, these weird omnidirectional lights, kind of that classic, you know, triangle. I'm like, holy shit, I didn't believe in UFOs, but these guys are like, they can't be lying to me because they certainly um, are credible guys and have a lot to lose. Shouldn't it be the president saying this stuff? Like, I don't want to be the purveyor of disclosure because I don't have all the data. Con deal from Yes Theory had several days with David Grush. If this information has been kept secret for 75 years, then what is to stop it from being secret another 75 years? It hasn't happened yet. That's why Dave Grush is, is standing out there. Chris Lado, welcome to Lado Files. David Grush is the 14 year Air Force veteran. He was an Intel officer and he has blow, blown the lid off of UAP disclosure. He has come forward and he says there are 40 other witnesses. He's interviewed personally 40 other witnesses over the past four years, many of them with direct contact with the program. David Grush has been investigating from behind the scenes, and then he got reprisals against him. He explains in this video, actually, the tools, how they actually implemented those reprisals against him. They attacked his PTSD in the past. So in this video, we'll go through David Grush's whistleblower claims. We'll cover the struggle that's going on behind the scenes within the system, you can tell, and he gives some, some insight into the struggle. He answers some questions on why he thinks the government is lying. And then finally, we look at the bigger picture. Grush does give a timeline of what he thinks is going to happen. It sounds like 2024 is going to be the year of full disclosure. Man, I don't know if I can wait that long. Thanks for being here. Please smash that like button. If you do like this content, share it to get the information out. Subscribe to get notifications of my future videos. I do premieres every Tuesday and Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern time. And if you want additional content behind the scenes, go to patreon.com forward slash Chris Lato or sign up here at YouTube and become a YouTube member. You'll get your name in the credits at the end of the video. The large guy has the smallest suitcase. <laughs> so how did I end up in a car with the UFO whistleblower testifying in front of Congress tomorrow to let the world know that we're not alone? For that, we have to go back three years, where I found myself in the middle of a very bizarre experience that would push me to ask some of the most fundamental questions I've ever dared to ask about the nature of existence itself. In the fall of 2020, with no prior interest in the topic, I visited a small town in Massachusetts to talk to a number of people who had experienced a mass sighting of UFOs in September of 1969. Over 300 people from a few neighboring towns saw something in the sky that defied our known laws of physics. And it just hovered right there. Not a sound, nothing. But even more bizarre than that, dozens of children went missing that night and claimed to have ended up on board of a craft. And then the only thing I can remember after that was being levitated over on the street. I had never felt more of an unsettling disconnection between my intuition and rationale. So I remember watching this video. So three years ago, he said without any previous interest, Amar did a deep dive into Berkshire's UFO. And I actually just, incidentally had done my own deep dive into Berkshire's UFO because of Martin Willis. In this interview, I've done a few videos with Martin Willis. Martin Willis went there and did an, his own in-person interview with many of the witnesses. And watching this just blew my mind. It was one of my first major cases that I actually looked into. And this guy, Tom Reed, he was basically up on the ship when these other people recognized him, recognized him as a kid. So. Very, very interesting case. And Amar Kandil, he made that great video about Berkshire's UFO, which is a little known mass sighting that happened back in 1969. Interesting. Link is in the description. If you were me, where would you look? Titles, programs, departments, regions. If you could just name anything. I'd be happy to give you that in a closed environment. I can tell you specifically. Thank you. Do you believe our government has made contact with intelligent extraterrestrials? It's something I can't discuss in public setting. Do you believe that our government is in possession of UAPs? Uh, absolutely, based on interviewing uh, over 40 witnesses over four years. 
And that's really his main claims. David Grush is saying after he investigated for four years and he talked to over 40 witnesses, many with firsthand direct contact, is that the U.S. does have a broad crash retrieval program. It's global in nature, and it has been kept secret for 75 years. Just unbelievable. He says those 40 witnesses have already testified to the inspector general of the intelligence community and to many people in Congress. So bigger question is, why isn't more being done? So Amar sets up basically a public hearing with people from the local environment. David Grush tells a interesting account here of a 300 foot triangular craft. Listen to this. And I be very general on this to protect this person's identity because they're still on active duty. But like, I remember interviewing a guy and I have a background in psychological analysis and other stuff to, you know, assess people and for like three hours. And it was a certain uh, very senior Navy individual that saw he was going to work at a certain facility uh, in the morning, you know, not drunk, not high. And a 300 foot triangular craft hovered over his car. Um, uh, for a couple minutes and it like he couldn't even process what he was seeing but then he took pictures of his car after the incident and all the zenith upper facing decks of his car were all got hit with ionizing radiation ultraviolet because the paint became milky his headlights totally went they were totally clear his car was perfect before the incident and i'm like holy crap you have physical artifacts the guy we assessed you know he had a normal psychological composition no weird belief system he's just a dude uh, that was going to work at a Navy base and, you know, he had a freaking huge craft. At least the physical proof he provided, he drew what he saw, no sound, these weird omnidirectional lights, kind of that classic, you know, triangle. I'm like, holy shit, I didn't believe in UFOs, but these guys are like, they can't be lying to me because they certainly um, are credible guys and have a lot to lose. He was super scared to come forward. He didn't tell his wife for five years. That was, I think, an inflection point for me where I'm like, okay, there's something going on that's not adversarial tech. I'm talking to these people that were literally in tears telling me this stuff because it was this emotional thing that they could not process analytically what they were seeing. It was like totally beyond their comprehension. So for what it's worth, yeah. I've never seen anything, believe it or not. So I came in as non-believers. So that, that was a powerful story for me because like he says, that was really the induction point when Dave realizes that, hey, this is real. Very credible people, high level, senior level people with nothing to gain and a lot to lose in tears, basically, as they're relaying these stories to him. There's no sound. It's a giant 300 foot triangular craft. I mean, just an unbelievable situation that they can't even process with their own eyes. This also relates how Dave changed in his views. He started out as a skeptic and he approached this whole problem as a skeptic, much like myself. I was very skeptical at the beginning, but once you start looking into it, you keep finding more and more evidence that just backs, backs it up. Another key point I learned from this interview is really insight into the struggle behind the scenes, what's going on behind the scenes. And I'm working on trying to get more things cleared for the hearing. Yeah, you know, like still, literally, as yeah, I'm yeah, working, yeah, yeah. talking to the DOD security office, wow. like as I was getting off the plane, yeah. like, please get something approved by 10 a.m. Yeah, because I wanted to be able to provide more detail. There's like a certain thing where it's like, shouldn't it be the president saying this stuff? Like, I don't want to be the mm. purveyor of disclosure because I don't have all the data. Yeah. I'm not in that leadership position and i yeah you know i'm just trying to you know uh, use a public pressure to kind of you know to, ke to get the executive branch to make a decision on what to release yeah did all the checks i could possibly do you know within my yeah. you know kind of official capacity realized it was real and then uh kind of during that investigation you know i had a lot of pushback that was very unfortunate you know reprisals against me and stuff and and that kind of was what led me to file the whistleblower complaint, you know, A, for my own protection, but B, was to kind of sound the alarm. They tried to claim all these things against me, conduct-wise, mm -hmm. mental health, all this other uh, unfortunate stuff. I was in combat in Afghanistan in 2013. You know, I was on convoys outside the wire. I, you know, I had a friend die, got blown up, and all this other stuff. You know, baggage that I had for two, three years after coming back. And, you know, I got diagnosed with you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, sought treatment, and I got help. 
good to go, but there was an agency that tried to dig that back up and say, oh, Dave still has ongoing issues, unmitigated, we need to pull his clearance. And then I had to show my medical records and be like, no, dude, I saw treatment, still do, because that's what you do. And they, they, they tried to use that against me. It was crazy. So Dave is working through the DOD security office and he already was voicing frustrations there that he couldn't have anything to release for the hearing, anything more to release. Dave also thinks that what he's doing is applying public pressure. He thinks that the pressure needs to be applied and he mentions executive branch. So he thinks the president himself should be relaying this information to the people. So he is pressuring the president, the executive branch, leaders of our country to actually do what they should do, do what is right, let everybody know that this is real. He also talks about the reprisals because he mentioned before that there were reprisals against him and he did fear for his life, but he didn't go into many details on it. This time, it sounds like there was specific agencies that came after him, looked into his background and started trying to use his medical and behavioral issues against him. Luckily, as Leslie Kane said, he is squeaky clean. Dave talks about his friend that died in Afghanistan, and he had post-traumatic stress disorder related to that. And these agencies, these people came after him to try and use that against him to pull his clearance. That's the way to actually pull his clearance so he can't have access to do any sort of this investigation. So they went after his access to this secret information. So, How are you feeling? Sounds a little... Uh, rest is last night. But I was told last night that they requested me to be cleared for a, a closed session after yeah, today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the request was denied. Wow, and right, it was blocked. Right. So that's like obvious obstruction. Luckily, Grush seems amazingly good at paperwork and managing the bureaucracy that is the giant government of the United States. He had some interesting questions and answered them in a few different venues. Let's check those out. Why do the politicians, like, why do the people who are higher up feel like they need to hide the, like, evidence? Or why do they not want us to know that? Yeah, I mean, that I can only be... know what the mindset was, you know, multiple decades ago. And, like, anything in government, they're resistant to change. So this is the way we set it up. They basically took the Manhattan Project secrecy and overlaid it on this issue. And then they realized the, the military and the national defense potential if the reverse engineering basically was successful. So we're going to lock it down. And then you remember trust in government was high back in the 40s post-war. And then also society was less secular. So there's, you know, they're worried about the religious ontological shocks as well. And they never really developed a, we'll call it disclosure plan for what it's worth. And they just were like, this is the way it's been. And we're going to keep it that way. And we don't want Russia and China to be exposed to any of this info. Fortunately, it's that kind of, kind of low energy thinking, you know? Yeah. So great answer there from Dave Grush on how and why they would keep it secret for this long, for 75 plus years. And what he says is, it sounds like initially they saw it, they learned about it. It's ontological shock. You can't believe it. Dangerous. Right? They somehow related to nuclear energy. So it's dangerous. They don't understand it and they hide it. So they initially hide it under the guise of nuclear energy, under nuclear weapons. But what happens is they realize that it is profitable. That's right. It is very profitable and it is much, much easier to stay in the lead on the world if you have an advantage. And so they kept it secret. They kept it secret because it is profitable, beneficial. And now you can't let our enemies know. We can't let our adversaries know that we have this technology. And since it's been kept secret for so long, after this many years, the lie has spoiled. This flies all over it. It needs to be released. He mentions they're also low energy thinking. If you think about that, low energy thinking is great as an excuse. It is great as a cover story excuse. So why are we keeping this secret? Well, because it would be terrible for the world. Ontological shock. What is the benefit? We don't need to scare all these poor people. Why would we give our enemies so much access to our information and to our technology. We would just be giving it away for nothing. There's no real benefit. This is low level thinking, right? What they're disregarding is this is an amazing, unbelievable breakthrough information that would be the biggest story in the human race. This is what they're ignoring. The biggest story in the human race and they are keeping it secret for their own gain and benefit. Think about that, everyone who's keeping this secret. 
continue on from what you were saying. Are we safe as like a human species? Because I mean, I might have watched too many movies. But like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we can only you know through external observation and humanistic lens, kind of an you know, see intent if it's malice or benevolent. I mean, if the universe certainly has a yin and yang, so they're certainly dark with light. So I think it's a mixed bag. It's just like humans, right? Humans are generally kind, but we also kill animals for food. And like, if you were a cow, you'd be like, these evil humans are going to chop me up and like, you know, eat me. So it's, but we're not actually benevolent or excuse me, malevolent as a whole, but some lower sentient species would see us as malevolent. So what lens you look at through. So when asked if these things are dangerous, David Grush basically goes into a description of nature. Is nature dangerous? Yeah, there's some animals that are dangerous, some that aren't. There's good humans, there's bad humans. You know, if you are a cow, you probably think humans are evil. Yeah, I don't know if that's a good analogy or not, but it sounds like he doesn't think that they uh, necessarily have the same goals or priorities as humans lateral agreements and they're like you know they kind of want to be release me like you know because they they do realize it was a it was a bad deal um with the ecosystem secrecy some people one of their arguments is like well how would they keep a secret i'm like dude i was cleared to some of the most nations most sensitive programs i used to handle the pdb you know i had full access to most dod activities and most of the stuff broad programs that were enduring have never leaked um, so the U S and its allies are very good at keeping secrecies to include programs that are, we'll say global in nature. And really it's been leaking like a sieve in some weird way for many decades. Now it's been mixed in with some BS in ufology and stuff, but the general gist of it's actually been out there for a long time. Um, it has been leaking in some sense. So. I hear this a lot is that the government could never keep a secret like this, you know, alien life on the planet earth. There's no way the government could keep this secret. It would leak. And David Grush relays here is, no, that could definitely be the case. He is aware of very high level programs, global programs, he says, that have never leaked, meaning they've been going on for many decades and have not leaked. He also states that this has leaked. The UAP has leaked. You see it all over the place. We generally know kind of the basic gist of the whole story, it sounds like. We know the basic story. Now we just need to fill in the details. And he mentions there that he brought the presidential daily briefing. So he brings the daily briefing to the president. He was clear to that level. Because Enrico Fermi was famously like, well, you know, where are, where are they overtly landing on the White House lawn kind of thing? But because we have like tangible physical evidence, at least, you know, the US government does, uh there is a there there on their existence but like what are they for like you know actually you know like we talked about it's like if they do exhibit bilateral symmetry and they're bipedal and everything that's like wow what is the chance in in bi biologically for them to develop in a similar way than us what if it's an intelligence engineering beings to look like us for ease of contact totally worth looking into it and i wish it was a area of study that you know wasn't stigmatized anymore and people yeah. can like here's the data the government has you have to figure it out you know? and this is probably the most interesting point for me during the whole interview is this idea of intelligent beings being engineered this idea of engineered beings meaning clones david grush has said that they do have bodies and when asked if they're alive or dead he doesn't give any details meaning could they be alive or dead or we don't know could they actually be engineered beings? He mentions engineered beings. And why would you do that for ease of contact? He mentions their bipedal and the Fermi paradox. So the, the argument is, is that any other life forms will not look like us. The idea is what are the chances that they could form exactly to be the same general makeup as humans? What is the actual chance of that in the whole giant universe? In this case, these ships, Maybe the ships are alive, or maybe the actual entity, the actual being is much larger or much smaller or in a different dimension. If you look at my theory, it would be a different size dimension. So this would actually be a, from coming from a different dimension in size. So could entities or beings there engineer these craft or the bodies inside? the actual creatures so that they could interact with us in some way. If you think of it like this, if we're trying to communicate with ants, would we make like a little animatronic ant? 
to go out there and like talk with the other ants, you know, to communicate with them, to initiate some sort of contact. I think this is the general idea that he's relaying here. And it's, it's quite interesting. I really like it. Grush talks about the bigger picture. Why is this going on? What are the details or intricacies on the global stage? Yeah, my biggest outrage was just like, wait, if this was broadly studied like nuclear physics, right? How you make a nuclear bomb classified. Physics, not. And the sequestration of astrobiology, astrophysics, etc., where you could build undergraduate, graduate, and postdoctoral programs of record to actually study this shit openly. Holy shit, that's like way better. And we can, you know, you know, potentially develop novel solutions for energy, etc. Who knows? But no, it was sequestered because it's like this like arms race thing. I'm like, man, this is ridiculous. And that was another reason why, you know, I that's why I did, yeah. Grush has mentioned this, I think, in every interview he's done is really his outrage. And he's used the words outrage, et cetera, on the sequestration of this technology for arms race reasons. And this is really when he steps to another level there. The low level thinking is going to be the excuses. We're scared. We're fear sharing this technology. We can't get it out there. It's for our own benefit so that we can make money and power, right? That's ultimately what Gresh is saying here is no, we have much more benefit, way more benefit for humanity as a whole and the whole planet by sharing this information, allowing everyone to actually benefit from it, analyze it. He mentions that was a main reason he actually came out and shared this information. If this information has been kept secret for 75 years, then what is to stop it from being secret another 75 years? It hasn't happened yet. That's why Dave Grush is, is standing out there. That's why he's standing out in front of the firing squad and taking all this heat. And, and thank you so much, David Grush. You're doing it with such honor and poise. Thank you. And it shows because what we'll see here is the bigger picture is many more Intel officers and other people are coming forward, more whistleblowers. That is the bigger picture. Studied physics, I became kind of agnostic. I was like, eh, I don't know about this, all this kind of woo-woo, you know, stuff that the church espouses and stuff. And then oddly enough, I've kind of come full circle. I think about the people, the journey I had, and the most random people that I've known that were placed in my life like 14 years ago, you know, shut the door in my office at the NGA and were like, look, dude. And, you know, they started telling me all this stuff that I was, un and they brought these like crazy Intel reports and I was like, I can't believe I'm even reading this. And it was like so wild. I mean, really, I'm not like trying to be hyperbolic at all. And yeah, I guess I've kind of come full circle. It's a like, really weird journey. Yeah, I don't know. What does the future look like? I mean, it seems like all we can do is research right now. Yeah, what is happening next is I know there's some Intel officers and other people in and out of government that are about to file complaints similar to what I did. Cause they said, fuck it, you know, and then they were on these programs, like firsthand dudes, you know, not people telling me stuff, like literally the dudes touching the stuff. February of 2024, we should have a presidential panel on UAP disclosure, looking at the crash retrieval issue and everything. And then within 300 days of the enactment of the act, uh, we're going to get some kind of, I think government statement next year on this topic. The tsunami wave is, is building and I don't think uh, we're going to totally backpedal anymore. Other than that, it would be totally speculation, but that's at least what's going to come. I think 2024 is going to be, knock on wood, potentially wild in a good way. So yeah. That is amazing. 2024. He gives so many details and inputs. So February 2024, it sounds like there will be a UAP presidential panel. Is that from Chuck Schumer's actual law that passed, the law that passed in the Senate, the NDAA 2024? Is that what will be... Driving that is my guess. And they said 300 days within that enactment, you will have some sort of government statement. And he says there, he's read these reports and they are completely mind-blowingly wild. So if you can imagine that, you're talking amazing details, right? Of alien life. However it is, you can say it's not extraterrestrial. You can say it's interdimensional, but it is a non-human intelligence. Non-human intelligence interacting with us, with humans. And what Dave relays is that he wants it to be a positive experience. The reason he came out is not to divide people. It is to try and unify people. And especially in the United States, but all around the world, is we're having a very polarization of our societies and our politics. I think through new technologies, through social media, et cetera. Either way, there is a polarizing effect, at least in the US for sure. 
And he wants this to be a unifying. Instead of just Democrats hating Republicans, Republicans hating Democrats, maybe we can realize that it is the system actually that is just pointing us against each other, pointing our weapons against each other is ultimately what we're doing when we could realize with this, that there is another non-human intelligence, okay? Humans are not the apex intelligence, at least on this planet, it looks like, and not in the universe, obviously. So Dave mentions here a tsunami. That is the tsunami of whistleblowers. You have over 40, I mean, over 40 whistleblowers and witnesses. That means the program is being outed. The people in this program have decided enough is enough. And finally, these people, these heroes, are taking the sacrifice. They are taking one for all of us, for the human team, essentially, to get this information out, to get it out from underneath the military industrial complex and spread the information with the rest of the world. Final insights from this video is Dave released some little details into the world of NDAs, so non-disclosure agreements, and the DOPSER process. That is how he actually gets the information out. I talked to John Greenwald. John Greenwald said, why doesn't he just release his DOPSER information? So David Gresh explains that it's a catch-22. The reason the government allows him to say these things, to actually say that we are in possession of non-human craft, non-human bodies, is because anyone who says, no, you can't say that any agency, like the CIA, for instance, or the NGA or NSA, they would have to state explicitly why and through classified means, but that would out them. That would out them inside the government as an unacknowledged, unacknowledged program. They're really good people. These are not evil people yeah, or anything yeah. like that, but they thought it was a raw deal. Because the funny thing is if you're in an unacknowledged program, you don't even know what you're getting briefed to when you are like, hey, we need you to sign NDA. You're going to be on something cool. Cool. What, what is it? <laughs> yeah. We can't tell you until you sign. Yeah. So, and then they sign it and then they see all the stipulations, how it's enforced. We're briefed in a very threatening manner. And um, I think they probably wish they've never, they never signed it, right? It just what about shows to the cynics too, who are like, yeah. it would have come out. There'd be photos or there are- No, they enforce sort of this crazy brutally. controls in place, mm -hmm. br brutal enforcement. Yeah. And what was the last special access program that leaked? They don't generally- No, leak. people are like, oh dude, wouldn't it be broadly leaked or whatever? I'm like, as somebody who is super cleared, to a lot of that conventional stuff over the years, stuff never leaks. Yeah, It doesn't come out. There are plenty of things that are pretty serious, they're broad, that have never seen the light of day. You know, the psychology of the typical career government worker, right? Stable paycheck, pension, maintain clearance. So if any of that's threatened, you know, they're gonna capitulate in most cases, yeah. right? And, you know, that was basically what happened to me, but I, you know, just decided to fight the system. I stumbled upon this, which arguably is the most interesting and fascinating and exciting thing ever. Well, why would I go back to doing my normal job and just shutting my mouth and sitting in my office and doing regular national defense stuff? Because our priorities are not even right if this other thing is legit. Yeah. And that's a great statement there. Our pr priorities aren't right if this is if this is true. I've also heard that a lot is why don't people just go against their NDAs? which is just unbelievable to me. If you look at whistleblowers in the past, they get hammered. They are put in jail for the rest of their lives. Their reputations and careers are totally ruined. I mean, look at Edward Snowden, look at Julian Assange, and whatever your beliefs on, on them, their lives are not normal, okay? They have been severely, severely affected their lives by publishing the information that they did without the correct approval. So how do you get approved to actually publish this information? That is through the Dopser request. Let's check it out here. He explains it. Uh, I don't want to get into specifics. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I know a lot of that stuff. Out of curiosity, yeah. why are you allowed to say that NHI pilots came uh, out of the craft, but you can't? You well, more that's all I put in the pre-publication stuff okay. that got approved. I mean, got it. I could go back and ask for more. Yeah, Any specific knowledge I garnered when I was on the other side of the door, yeah. if I want to talk about that publicly, everybody who ha has had a job like I have has to submit it to a thing called Dopser mm -hmm. at the Pentagon, DOD Pre-Publication and Security Review. You know, even if it's about this stuff, like I know that sounds insane, but like you literally have to say like, this is what I want to talk about. Why do you think they approved it? Catch-22, because so they'd have to self-identify and highlight their concerns to redact. Yeah. So the office who would propose a redaction, say it's a three-letter agency or whatever. So they would have to self-acknowledge 
So I think when I submitted that, they had a choice, right? Either we try to sequester Dave's ability to speak publicly and try to tell him no, but then we have to give him a reason and tell him what organization said no. If it got redacted like that and it cited what organization and what security reason it is, I would just publish that. Yeah. And then the, the public can under, you know, mm. make uh, its own interpretation why you know, the U.S. government's withholding information about that kind of thing and, and wanted to sequester my speech. So there, David explains very clearly about the approval process on Dopser and the reason they couldn't deny his request, because as soon as they start denying it, now all of a sudden is who's denying it and why? And now they will get outed. So this just shows the power of whistleblowers. Once they actually get out there, David Grush is out there. He's already said his piece. He's already done it in front of Congress multiple times. He's already talk to the inspector generals. They've already tried to stop him. They've tried to stop him over the past few years, but they were unable to stop him, man. The guy is a bureaucratic genius. He has a knowledge of administration. And like he talked about, if he was cleared into the program firsthand, he wouldn't have been able to do what he did. So he was able to do this because he wasn't cleared because he didn't sign those NDAs where they're basically going to say, we're going to come kill you, ruin your life. If you talk about this information that should be shared, with all humans on the planet, because a small group, a very, very small group of scared, low level thinking humans have created this system and are not letting us get out of it. The military industrial complex has locked down on this, but guess what's coming? A tsunami of whistleblowers, like David Grush just said, it's like a, man, it's like a boa constrictor just tightening down, tightening down on the truth. And they kept attacking him and they can't find anything, right? They found the PTSD, they tried to stop him there can't stop it. He knows all the rules. He knows all the laws. And the guy can read regulations like a fighter pilot. You know, he's worked with fighter pilots for decades. And the final point, David Grush really wants his message to be a unifying message. And I think that's totally possible. This is a unifying message. Okay. It is a scary concept, a scary thing to find out that we're not alone in the world. I don't know what's scarier that there's no one else out in the universe or that there is something else out in the universe. I think undoubtedly, just based on the numbers and the evidence laying around, is there are non-human intelligences here on Earth somehow. How do they get here? We don't know. It sounds like they could be engineered beings. It sounds like the US has known about it for a long time. The basic general idea, we know. There has been a crash retrieval program for many decades, 75 years. They've kept all this information secret why yeah i would love to know same as you guys and i think we will 2024 man 2023 was amazing we got huge information we got whistleblowers galore coming out and now 2024 looks set to be even more of a banger it's going to be a banger year for uaps so please subscribe you'll get uh, future notifications share this video Try and get the information out. It is not getting out into the mainstream. David Grush, I mean, his credibility, his knowledge, and the information he's released is not really getting out into mainstream. We covered David Grush's amazing whistleblower claims. I mean, 40 whistleblowers coming out. He brings up the story of the 300-foot triangular craft. Hadn't heard that story before. That was an amazing story. We go through the struggle he's had within the system. David Grush has. They bring up his friend. They tried to actually use that PTSD and other, who knows, the medical issues against him to try and stop him before. Those were the start of the reprisals. We also learned about the skiff, right? They blocked him from actually going into a secret room. That's obvious obstruction, right? Obvious obstruction. He says that at the time he's fought it the whole way through, but they can't stop him. There were some interesting questions raised during this video as well. Why is the government lying about UAPs? I think it's for the reasons we suspected. It was scary. It was nuclear weapons. It was new ontological shock. And then, then they realized, oh, we can make a ton of money and power. We can gain world power with this information. We're not going to share it with anybody. And that's where we ended up now. It sounds like these objects, yeah, could be dangerous. They're a part of nature. It would be nice to know. Nice to know for the rest of us humans, what's going on out there? What is the universe made of? What's astrobiology? How can they keep this from us is enraging. And that was the, the one issue that really made Dave the maddest is they kept this secret. Could have been shared with the rest of the world 
for huge, huge gains, right? This is information about our universe that they are keeping from us. The US government, along with other governments or elements of the government, right? Secret elements inside the government, really a small group of people are keeping the secret from the rest of us. And that really makes Dave and me angry. My favorite point in this interview is he talked about, could these be engineered beings to allow contact with us? You know, why can't we find these, all these beings laying around? Maybe they're not actually here. Maybe they're here, but in some other form, in a larger scale, very smaller scale, different dimension. That's what he talks about. So are these engineered beings to actually just communicate with us in some sort of weird contact way? He thinks that should definitely be looked at. And then went into the NDAs. That was interesting on that. They don't know what they're signing. You just have to sign the NDA before you actually see it. And now imagine you sign that and it's like, okay, there is aliens. And if you tell anyone, we're going to kill you and your family. <laughs> imagine that. Oh, man. Uh, you probably wouldn't sign it if you knew the repercussions before signing it. That's what he said anyway. And then 2024, can't wait for it. Please smash that like button. Share this information to get it out. Subscribe to keep up to date. I release videos every Tuesday and Friday. And then if you want additional content, sign up to be a YouTube member here on YouTube or go to patreon.com forward slash Chris Lado. Thanks for being here. Have a great day. Peace.